morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the DSC Jaipur Literature Festival, the Tata Steel Front Lawns. Before we start, I would like to thank, on behalf of DSC Teamwork and all our partners, I would like to thank our sponsors, DSC, Tata Steel, Google, Airtel, Coca-Cola, Rajasthan Tourism, Councilage, ICCR, Public Diplomacy Division, Incredible India. Our session this morning is uh, Maps for Lost Writers, Nurturing Creativity. We have with us Anoshirani, Prajwal Parajali, Aita Igodaru, Hindol Sen Gupta, and the session is moderated by Meru Gokhale. This session is presented by McCann World Group. May I request you all to please turn your mobiles on silent mode so we don't disturb your, the people next to you. There will be a question session at the end and you will all be given a chance to ask questions. The, the authors will be signing books at the far end of the lawns after the session. Thank you. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, great. So, uh, I'm Meru Gokhale. I'm the only person here who's not a writer. I'm an editor, which is a completely different, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to find out in this session what writers really think about editors. <laughs> At least I'm going to try. So we have here, we have three novelists and a non-fiction writer. And what we wanted to do was keep this session concentrated on the creative process and how you actually get from having an idea about writing a book to actually having a finished book. And I'm hoping everybody here will share their experiences and I'm assuming some of you out here will, will be people who will be wanting to write books. So, I mean around 20-25 minutes into the session, we'd really like you to participate as well to hear about, you know, what your questions are about how, how to become a writer from just having an idea. So I'm going to start by asking everybody, um, what, what made you want to be a writer? Do you want, do you want to start? Hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good, perfect. Um, hello, everybody. I'm, I'm Aita Vigadari, as, as you just said. Um, I, what made me want to be a writer? Um, I think it, it was something I, I've always read a lot. You know, for, from a very young age, I've been fascinated by books. Um, they, you know, for as soon as I could, could read, I was reading whenever, whenever I got a spare moment. So I think when I got a bit older, it was... Um, it was, a na it was a natural progression to, um, you know, to then move on to, to think about writing my own stories. And um, as my as my life experiences became more and more, well, I, well, I, well I, you know, more, more more potentially interesting, and um, you know, gave me more food for thought. Uh, I thought, you know, uh, around the time after leaving uh, after leaving Oxford, um, when I um, was. Uh, doing a variety of different things, um, from working in television to um, modeling, um, to traveling a lot. I thought, now's a good time. I've sort of collected enough stories. I've read enough books. Now's the time to maybe experiment with putting something on paper and, and seeing how it turns out. What about you, Hindol? So I'm the only nonfiction writer on this panel. Uh, I'm Hindol Gupta. I wrote a book called The Liberals this year uh, on living through 20 years of economic liberalization. I work as a journalist for Fortune in India. Uh, I wanted to look at the period of liberalization, which had always been looked at as an economic phenomenon in India, and also as a political phenomenon in India. And I wanted to try and tell the story of what happens to human beings when such a churn happens in a society. And I thought my generation, which had real no experience or no memory or no collective memory of the two big things that had happened before liberalization, one of course was the 1947 independence, right? And we of course are not midnight children in that sense, right? We are also not a generation that really remembers the you know, 1984 riots, for instance, in Delhi. So those key elements of our history, we don't, we're not a, a generation, for instance, of the emergency, which was almost the dictatorship period of India. So none of those big turmoil changes are something that really affected our generation. So our memory, we were almost, as Meghna Desai put it when he read the book, we are Manmohan's children. We are, you know, literally the, the byproducts of Manmohan Singh, the, the, the Honorable Prime Minister's policies, which he took as a finance minister all those years ago. And I wanted to tell that story, and the easy thing for me to do, and that's what I really thought I would do, was to write a non-fiction book about economics, pie charts, graphs, this, that, and the other. 
Uh, then I sort of remembered that I flunked mathematics many times in school, <laughs> and I realized that's I've heard a lot of writers happen. say this, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm a only business journalist who sucks at maths, so I realized I couldn't really do that. I don't have the competence. So I basically then wrote about the only thing. Sorry, excuse me. I wrote about the only thing that I truly understood, which was myself and my life, and I turned the sort of camera, so to speak, inwards to say, if there was somebody who was about 10 when it all began, is about 30 today, how did life change for that middle class person in India? And that's why, you know, the liberals to sort of say, that's our generation, that's what we feel. And it was interesting because, you know, now we're talking about this aspiring generation in India, there are protests, protests on the streets of Delhi, and there's, you know, every political party is saying, well, you know, focus on the middle class. Well, we are the middle class. So, so was it a way for you to understand the world as it was for your generation? Absolutely. It was also a way for me to understand myself. Because, you know, I think all writers have many unresolved things within. And writing is always, a, I mean, much greater writers than me have said before, that it's a cathartic process. Um, it was very cathartic for me because a lot of the turmoil in my family, um, you know, the money that my parents lost, the battles that my... Uh, parents had to fight with the very bureaucratic Indian health system when my grandparents were dying of cancer. Uh, we knew that, uh, you know, what middle class poverty is all about. So all of those battles in some senses got resolved when I wrote that book. Uh, and for me, that, that was the... Great and what about you, Prajwal? Um, uh, can you hear me? You chose to write fiction. Yeah. Uh, See, my answer is a lot more stick. I, I started writing because... Can you hear him or do we need to get him another yeah. mic? Yeah. Hi. I think we need some help. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, my answer is a lot more simplistic. I started writing simply because I had nothing to do. I, I had just quit my job as an advertising executive. Uh, I had traveled around a little, finding in it uh, not uh, a lot of pleasure. And I had to legitimize my existence in some way. Uh, so writing seemed like the easiest way to uh, shut up people around me. You know, when, when, when you're not doing anything and you say that you're writing, uh, there is some skepticism, but it's still better than saying you're doing nothing. Uh, that's, that's how I wrote my first collection of short stories. I, I chose to write the collection of short stories uh, because at that point I thought it would be easier to do a collection of short stories than a novel. Uh, of course, after I wrote my novel, my second book, I realized the novel was a lot easier than the collection of short stories. But uh, yeah, that's, that's how I started writing. And what about you? For me, I... I know she's written three books, so he's, you know, I, I'm very interested in the process between the first book and the second, because I think each one is different, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. When you're writing the first novel, uh, at least for me, I had no idea what I was doing. And uh, that was my greatest strength. You know, at the time, you don't know what the rules are, you don't care what they are, and you sort of just leap into the unknown without any fear at all. And uh, that's what I found helped me when I wrote my first novel. Then you realize actually how So you hard mean it's it a is. less self-conscious process, doing yes, the first absolutely, novel? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Because you don't think so much about structure, you don't think so much. It's, it's purely a subconscious um, process for me. Even now when I write, I, I find myself thinking about these things much later on. Uh, so I, I find it gets harder and this is not to depress people who want to write, but it, it does get harder at least for me, uh, whether I'm writing plays or novels. Uh, once you understand process more, you start becoming more conscious of things. I think that's a very good piece of advice there is don't overthink it because I think, you know, sometimes people spend a lot of time thinking you know, how do I do this? But I think you just sort of have to get on and do it, isn't it? 
I, I, I beg to differ. I don't know. Tell us. Yeah, of, that's uh, really interesting. Uh, but I, I mean, really, I think it's um, writing is such a such a personal thing, and, and the way that you write, I think, is also um, very personal. And I, you know, I've got I've got my views, which are completely different to many of my writer friends. But tell us a little more about. I mean, actually, I'm a big fan of planning and thinking it through. Um, I don't know. I'm sort of uh, I, I'm terrified of. Uh, of rambling and books that ramble, so I'm, I, I like to just have a clear structure and know exactly what I'm going to write at each part. And then, you know, you will then go and edit it and shift it around afterwards. But I find that if I start with a sort of completely blank canvas, um, it, things do not go so well. So you mean you sort of plot everything out and then do the writing after that? Yeah, exactly. But to and what about you guys? So I think. I think for me, the big thing was that I was really afraid of editors too, you know, when I began out, I was really, it was really intimidating. What were you afraid of? You know, I was, the whole process, because there seemed to be, you know, agents and editors and press and all of that, and that whole process seemed to be really intimidating. And I was intimidated by that entire glamour and everybody seemed to be, you know, in India, everybody seemed to be writing a book and, you know, getting all these advances. The other big challenge for me, at least, was because I wrote, I turned the lens towards myself, what do you write and what do you keep away? You know, my mother told me when I told her that, you know, I'm going to write about myself in this book and not about economics. She said, well, you know, your biggest challenge is going to be, are you going to be honest? And how far will you be? So I think honesty is a big challenge because even when you're writing fiction, at least I, that's what I think, there's always parts of you that you're subconsciously revealing. It's a kind of emotional honesty. It is a, a kind of emotional honesty. And how far do you want to be honest? Also, the other big fear that I felt is that when you're writing, when you're actually, that act of putting words on paper suddenly gives you revelations of what you really think in your mind about yourself. And some of those things, maybe you, do, you prefer not to be addressed. You know, we all try to hide things under the carpet. We don't want these things to, you know, come out. That's why they say don't do Vipassana because you might not like what comes out. So to me, writing is a bit like that. So... And what, what, what about you? I mean, what, what is, is sort of revealing yourself the major, is that, is that fear what stops people from actually putting their experiences on the page? Well, I don't know. I think I'm a pretty boring person, so uh, <laughs> I don't know how I would translate well into an um, exciting character in my book. So I, I try to keep very little, uh, there is nothing uh, autobiographical, uh, biographical about uh, any of my stories or my second book for that matter uh, so yeah that that has so how been do you, an issue how do you find your story then that's that's because a lot of people you know when they're writing they're writing even they write if they're about other characters there's a lot of themselves in it and how do you find how do you decide what to write about in life in the news uh, in in everyday happenings around you uh, uh, you uh, marry the obnoxiousness of a relative with the loud mountedness of an aunt and then juxtapose that with, with, with the idiosyncrasies of a cousin and I mean you have a, a fairly eccentric character who is going to make your book a little interest, make your book interesting. So uh, I don't go out uh, consciously looking for stories. Uh, I think that's a surefire way of leading a miserable life if you do. But, uh, 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 but uh, there are stories everywhere and uh, I think it's all a matter of opening your eyes and ears and uh, looking around you. I think that's a really good point because Writers are some of the most observant people, aren't they? They're sort of always watching and, and they, even if they're not taking notes, they're sort of always recording and observing and analyzing human emotions. And is that, is that sort of the most important skill of a novelist? What do you think? I think, uh, I'll just go back one, yeah. one minute uh, to talk about what, where the idea comes from. So for instance, for my novel, The Cripple and His Talismans, it's the story of a man who wakes up in hospital one day without his left arm. He doesn't know how he's lost it, and he goes looking for it in the underbelly of Bombay, where he meets a whole range of characters that give him hints and clues that lead him to a man who sells arms and legs. Now, the idea for this story came in the form of a single image. I was um, writing uh, the end to one of my short stories, and I had this image of amputated limbs hanging from the ceiling in a very dark dungeon. Now, I have no idea where this image came from. 
but it refused to go away. And I think when that happens, it's a gift for a writer. You get consumed by maybe just one single image, but because it refused to leave, I was forced to explore it. And the more I started exploring it, the more I realized that there's really some depth here and then there's actually a, a novel in this. So I don't write about myself uh, like you. I don't write about myself that much, but you look for some level of truth. You keep digging for the truth. That's what you're doing as a novelist, whether you're a non-fiction writer or a fiction writer, you're constantly digging for truth. And eventually it helps you understand the world better, but at some point it sort of helps you to, to shift what's, what's actually existing. Novelists don't give answers. They just sort of form cracks. They, they keep coming at you with, with questions. And I think that's what literature does. So we have two people here who write about their experiences and two people who move away from their experiences. And, but, but there must be some, a part of you which has to use, yeah. you know, sort of your own... It depends on which novel it is. So for my next book, Danu Road, which is set in a small town in Danu, I wrote the history of the Zoroastrians, how they were persecuted, you know, uh, from Iran by the Muslims and they settled down and started fruit orchards. And that was the most personal book I wrote. But every book, every story has its process and you try not to write the same book again and again and therefore your process changes. also changes. So let's ask them a little bit about how you actually write a book. <coughs> so the first time when you decided to do it, how did you do it? How's, how did I do how it? How did you actually do it? And you knew you wanted to be a writer, you were interested in, how did you actually go from that, you know, to sitting down, in the, because it's a very disciplined profession. And there's, it requires a lot of discipline to actually write a complete book, you know. I, I, I guess so. I mean, it never, it never felt too much like discipline to me because, it, you know, it was something I enjoyed doing. And it was actually sort of, you know, writing was, was sort of my hobby that I was sort of doing, you know, well, well, you know, for a while I was doing it for fun. I had all these ideas in my head and I really wanted to write about them. Um, and so it didn't feel too much like discipline to me, actually. And I think that a lot of writers do feel that they, they have to write. Um, so, you know, I so don't... It's kind of an it, internal it, drive. It, 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 a bit of a drive without wanting to sound sort of <laughs> poncy about it. You know, sort of, I have to write. But, you know, it was something that I, you know, I really kind of wanted to do. And, um, and I don't beat myself up about it. I'm not kind of going to set myself, I have to do, you know, X number of words every day. Because then I think that's the way to make writing quickly become a chore. And I want to always enjoy it. And I think when the writer enjoys it, it is evident in the work. So, um, you know, uh, if my if my editor says give me something you know by by next year i'll sort of give myself maybe a monthly word target but you know I, that means i can go a week without writing a thing or i can do a week writing you know every day um all day so yeah and what about you I mean, do you do I, i've heard a lot of writers talk about word targets you know where they say oh if i write 500 words a day or 1,000 words a day, then it's like putting little blocks of information together because sort of the challenge of writing a complete book just feels very daunting. Yeah. So how do you do it then? Um, I actually really struggle with it. Uh, I, I, I'm bad at deadlines. Um, I'm, I really suck at deadlines. That's another problem for me being a journalist. But, um, but when I write, I actually, instead of putting a word deadline, I try to put an image deadline to just go to go back to what you were asking, how, did, how does a book begin? For me, this book began when I was sort of standing for about a month in this little place called Shingu outside Calcutta, where ta the Tatars were building an auto company, an auto plant, right? And there were mass protests that were happening against that plant. And I was there every day for about 16, 17 hours. And I was seeing all these villagers very angry, protesting against you know, one of the best companies uh, in, in India. And I could see that the company was also trying to do their best, and yet somehow something was not working, right? And that image stayed with me, and, and it spoke to me about what liberalization actually means from different perspectives. So I, I, I try to write, and at least this book I try to write with, trying to place those images almost like in, you know, when you, you know, like a jigsaw puzzle and to fill that puzzle with each image and build chapters and narratives based on those images. So that's how I try to write this book because you know, putting a word deadline doesn't really, I mean, I, I fail at it miserably. So that was my process at least for this book. Um, see, I, I tried uh, setting a deadline for myself. I tried uh, completing a certain number of words a day 
everything boomerang on me. It, it, it just didn't work. Um, uh, I am the most ill-disciplined writer on earth. I don't write for days and days and days. And then uh, suddenly there's this burst of inspiration that strikes and then I write for 15 hour stretches. Um, by now I've been writing for somewhat 15 long... 15 hour stretches. Yeah, I've done that. I have. Uh, but, you know, it's not conducive to health at all. I, I, it's not. Uh, but I may die of clogged arteries before I'm 32 <laughs> because uh, it, it's, it's not right. Your sleep patterns are all messed up. Uh, it's, it's just not fun. So I've been writing for about two and a half years now and uh, I know sufficiently well that when this burst of inspiration strikes, I know need to abandon every social activity, every appointment, and just write and write and write. Uh, it's worked for me so far. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it'll work for you. So after a certain point, after you've been writing for some time, you realize what works for you and embrace that and, 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 and uh, get rid of what doesn't work for you. But uh, disciplining myself is, is definitely it. So in a way what you're saying is, you know, this session is called Maps for Lost Writers. So you have to sort of find your, make your own map is what you're saying. And then yeah. sort of, once you've made it and you follow it after that. But what about you? I mean, Again, it's the same uh, thing for me is that there will be stretches when uh, I, I write a lot. And there will be stretches when I'm not writing, but it doesn't mean I'm not working. You know. Yes, I know. I don't know why people feel you need to explain this. I, I, I know to me yeah. because this, uh, mm -hmm. th that thinking process is a huge part of writing. And uh, sometimes you see people who say that unless somebody's tapping away at a keyboard, that they're not w working. Yeah. But the thinking is as much a part of it, I suppose, as. Absolutely. So, for instance, I mean, I live in Canada and I come to India once a year. I spend two or three months in Bombay because that's the city I write about. Uh, what I do, uh, in fact, I rarely write when I'm in India. I just walk through the city at different times. I'll wake up early in the morning, uh, I'll walk. Uh, afternoon, I'll walk. Night, maybe through the red light district because I grew up right opposite it. Uh, I just walk through the city. And you have to sort of, for me, literature is about also being in touch with the street. It, it emerges, it's rooted deeply at, at a street level for me. It's always been that way. I mean, the intellectual process takes place in your room with your computer and, and so on, but you have to be connected, completely rooted with the earth in a way to write about it. And for me, going back to the street and just seeing these images, talking to people or, or just being a voyeur and an observer, uh, I think that helps you develop some sort of compassion and empathy. And I think that is the function of the novelist, is really you, you empathize with people's pain and that makes your work uh, universal. So that's interesting because um, all four of you have talked about finding a balance between sort of getting a certain output on the page and thinking about things and sort of analyzing things. And so t what, what inspires you? What, what, is the, what is the thing which you use to sort of, you know, get that spark going? Well, actually, I'll just add to your last thing as well, because it is, you know, I think there was a third element. There's, you know, the thinking and the analyzing and there's putting it on the page. But I, I think there's also an element of just doing absolutely nothing, which is kind of also what we've been talking about. And, like a fallow period. You know, where you, all, you know, where you, well, maybe this is just my wishful thinking, that I'm sort of being productive when I'm not. But, you know, where, where things are just happening that you're not even aware of. But, um, you know, they kind of, uh, I think then the idea is sort of uh, crystallizing almost subconsciously. Um, and, and then, you know, and then they'll mani it will manifest itself um, in, in an idea which you can then write about. But um, so I, you know, so when I was um, in between my first novel, um, which was a uh, syntrope, <laughs> and um, it, after that I um, actually didn't know what I was going to write about for a while. And I was kind of, I was really worried about that. Um, but, you know, then I just thought, no, just take some time out, did, you know, don't do anything. And, and then I had the idea for, for All the Glitters, and it came to me, and it um, suddenly uh, crystallized very strong, very clearly in my, in my mind. And so what, what, do you use any tricks to get inspiration when you have, suppose you have a long stretch of time when, you, is there something brewing, but, you know, you need, you need a catalyst almost to get from 
get from that stage of thinking to say, okay, now here, here are the words on the page. So what, what do you use to inspire yourself? I mean, do you have any tricks that you can share with the audience? <laughs> I actually travel. I, I tend to go away. I think one of the... Uh, actually, also, I agree with Anush that you need, you need to go deeper and deeper and connect with people on the street, literally. And to me, uh, the street would mean more than just an urban landscape. I tend to go away, far away from urban landscapes. Increasingly, I find myself leaving the city. Um, idealistic as it might seem, I still believe that <coughs> writing must in some senses, and it's the job of the writer to bring out voices that otherwise would not be told. Uh, and not enough, maybe because I live in India, <clears throat> where the organized press, in some senses, focuses on a very small part of society. Um, I consistently feel that it's, it's, it, it's almost a, a, a responsibility for every writer to go out there. Out there after that, I'm very badly disciplined. So I, I'm always you know, surfing the net and watching YouTube and getting SMSs. So I like what I call you know, spaces which don't have connectivity. I like mobile connectivity free spaces. And in India, I largely get them out of the cities. And that seems to be the only place where I can get some thoughts in order. That's really interesting because I've, this has become quite a theme with writers that I've spoken to recently. I mean, of course, you brought it up right now about how do writers cope with the distraction of the internet? Because um, it, apparently this is like the biggest creative or rather, it's, it, it's the thing which makes people waste the most time, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, how do, you, how do you cut yourself off enough to... I mean, how, do you but guys have are, the discipline to... There are people that weak. I mean, so was that? you have to be really weak to be completely addicted to it. I mean, I don't, I don't really have a problem with that. I mean, there are bigger <laughs> issues to deal with in the sense that, you know, for me, uh, when you're talking about uh, what tricks do you use, I don't use any tricks. If the words aren't coming, um, I just wait. I, I train myself to be patient. And I, the, the uh, writer Nuruddin Farah said something very um, insightful. He said, there's no such thing as writer's block. There's only the writer's impatience. Mm -hmm. And when I find myself pushing and pushing and pushing, I realize I don't need to do that. I just have to be patient. Uh, there's a short story called The Long Distance, uh, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. Um, and I think that's a great title for a novelist. Because when you're writing a novel, you're lonely and you need endurance, you need stamina. So when you, you start to write a novel, you know you're in it for the long run. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and you just have to train yourself to be patient. That's really interesting because uh, Zadie Smith recently thanked an um, internet app called Self Control in, for her last book. And she said if she didn't have that app, which basically what it does is it blocks out the internet for a certain set number of hours a day, and whatever you do, it will not let you go on in. And she, she's actually acknowledged it in her book and thanked it. I mean, what about you guys? Do you Jonathan also think... Safran Foyer said, for instance, that he... Yeah. You know, Jonathan Safran Foyer famously said that he tapes up all the sort of, you know, internet connections on his laptop with, you know, duct tape which you cannot take off for the time that he's writing. So, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, fantastic. I mean, all my admiration for you who has the discipline. I certainly don't. And I, I don't either. <laughs> You know, I can't write Jack in New York, I can't write Jack in London. Uh, if I am to get a lot of work done, I have to disappear to the Himalayas. I'm from Gangtok in Sikkim, uh, which is a very small town with, that, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, not very many distractions. So, wow, you're really disciplined. I know, you, you, you're the also, exception. I no, no, you have to understand, I also live in Canada. So uh -huh, I write, uh -huh. there's a huge mountain in front of me and there's a cat. And, you know, oh, uh, right, well, sure. that makes <laughs> I, I, I'd actually have to say that I find the internet quite a useful resource while I'm writing. So, how, how so? Um, yeah, I would, I would actually sort of uh, recommend having it there, but not using it too much. But, um, I mean, just in very small ways, I mean, if I want to write about... Um, a town, you know, um, somewhere I've forgotten quite how to spell it or something like that. You know, just, just little things like that, but it's just, you know, or um, maybe uh, if I, you know, to embellish an idea, I might have a quick look and sort of uh, see if uh, there are similar items on the internet. But, you, you, you know, just, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rely on it as your, your leading, um, you know, tool for, for sort of academic research or, or you know, <laughs> anything like that. But I think um, for just little, little extra bits of um, help or detail you need while you're writing, I actually think it can be a, a very valuable tool. 
the, the internet is also an amazing resource for first time writers who are looking to find publishers. And I think it will be interesting to talk about the publishing process a little bit because I, I find a lot of people think they find it confusing. They, let's say now you've got to the point where you've actually written a book. Now how do you get it published? How did you guys find publishers? Um, I, uh, well, I, my, I was published first in, in the UK, um, in England, and, and so there the, uh, the key person really in, in getting you with that actual book deal is, is the agent. And I know that it's slightly different, I think, in India. I, mean, I didn't know if you guys went via an agent, but no, um, you, did, you did. I didn't uh, so How yes, did you find an agent? Because yeah. yesterday I did a session with Ravinder Singh, and he, I think he went directly to the publisher and said it's not always necessary in India, but um, I, I found an agent, um, I, I, I sent my manuscript off to a number of agents, and uh, I think, you know, every author has to deal with uh, rejection in some shape or form, you know, whether it's from some of the readers or initially from agents and publishers, and so I wasn't surprised to be turned down by, a, you know, initially by a large number of agents, but what was great was that they gave me some very constructive advice, so they said, you know, saint Bay has, you know, um, the, it, it could be a really, really great book, but I think you need to change X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, so I revisited the book. I sent it out again. And the second time around, I was really lucky, actually, to get an extremely positive response from a few different agents. So you took agents. the constructive feedback that you got. Yes, yes. And, and, yeah, that's a really good piece of advice for anyone out there who's looking to write a book. Don't take advice, I suppose, too personally. And don't try be to disheartened. Take don't, don't be disheartened. Yeah. It's so subjective. You know, what's right for one person is not right for another person. Sometimes it's just changing your opening line to make it a really sort of, really, you know, really jump out at the reader. Just something. You know, the, the editors, um, they, they, they have very little time, so they read very quickly. And if they don't like the beginning, they'll tend to just sort of, you know, bull up. Well, you, wouldn't, you, know, you, you probably know this more than I do, but I think you've got to grab their attention um, initially. Yeah, I think that's true. What, what, what about you guys? How did you find agents or publishers? How did you sort of navigate this complicated and sometimes quite opaque world? So I actually, you know, a huge amount of credit for the book that I wrote last uh, goes to the people, the editors. I didn't have an agent when I wrote it. Uh, I sort of walked into uh, the office of a commissioning editor at HarperCollins, which published my book, and it turned out he was also Bengali, so we got chatting. And as it this often happens, it's quite common in India, by the way. It's very common in India, and it also transpired that he was a senior of mine from school. But having said that, the three ideas I told him, he said all of them were rubbish, and <laughs> and told me to constructive go back feedback there. Very constructive <laughs> feedback, and told me to you know. So we got talking about something else, and he said, but you know, there's something there which is what I finally focused on. And this book had three different avatars before it finally got published. So I rewrote large chunks of it with the feedback at it. But then the funny thing happened, the guy who bought the book left HarperCollins, and then the book went to the table of, of the head of HarperCollins, and who's actually sitting here, I think I saw her here. Yes, Kartika's there. So who actually again then gave me really good feedback saying, what were the portions I was repeating? What were the portions I was not getting right? And that took time. So I think one of the things that writers need to you know, learn is that it takes time. It really does. It takes time to get a book right and then publish. Unlike in anything else that you're trying to do, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you write something, it'll get published, you'll make money, you'll get onto the new thing. So I, I found the process very, and now of course after I, as the book was getting published, I, I met my agent, who's now my agent, who's also sitting here. Um, and, and now I find the process even more enriching because she looked at the book, which had already been published, and you know, uh, we are now working on the next one, and had all the uh, uh, very important advice to give on what I may have got wrong, even in the book I have published, right? And that really helps me in the next books that I do. So uh, writers have huge egos. So I think we all need to diminish those <laughs> egos a bit uh, to really, I mean, I think that really helps. Big generalization there. <laughs> <laughs> OK, some writers have Well, I think, uh, some. you know, f the first thing is if you want to get published, it would probably be a good idea to write a book. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because I, I find it that, sounds very obvious. Yeah, but and like we were discussing earlier, there are so many people who say, yes, I'm a writer. What have you written? I have an idea. Yeah. Well, an idea is very different from actually having a manuscript because you can't really show an idea. No one can read an idea, you know. And so for first-time writers, forget about agents or publishers. Get that story that you want to tell and work really hard on it. 
and then start looking for agents or publishers. I mean, always go back first to the work because that's where everything starts. Um, yeah, I, I uh, met my agent in a very serendipitous manner. I had written about five stories uh, and uh, had applied to uh, Creative Writing Masters at Oxford. Uh, I was invited to an interview about uh, interview, and uh, uh, I sort of started brushing up on my uh, knowledge of literature or uh, in which there was uh, some lack, you know, because I was not an English major in college. And uh, that's when I came across an ad for the London Book Fair in London. I decided to attend it because Hilary Mantle was speaking and I thought it would be a very uh, pretentious, pedantic, Oxford-like thing to do if I dropped him in at the interview. Um, uh, uh, the morning of the, the London Book Fair event, uh, I couldn't really find any good reading material at my sister's place, uh, 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 which is where I was staying. So I picked up one of my stories and, and uh, left for Earl's Court, where the fair was taking place. Now, it so happened that this year, the uh, London Book Fair was a poorly attended affair because of the volcanic ashes. This was in 2010. Stalls that were supposed to be full were not. People that were, who were supposed to fly in from various parts of the world weren't there. Uh, I sat next to a disgruntled woman who complained that she, she, all her meetings had gotten cancelled on account of the, or of the ashes. Uh, uh, and I uh, asked her who she was. She said she was a literary agent. Uh, what's her name? Susan Yeward. Mary, you met Susan a few days ago, didn't you? Yeah. So I gave her my story and she wrote to me a few days later asking to read the rest of my stories. Um, so going to fairs, going to uh, you know, these uh, festivals is very important. I mean, you know, we have been talking about all the great writers who are here at the Jeppe Literary Festival. What we haven't been talking about is all the great agents who are here right now. You, we have some of the biggest agents in the world at the Jeppe Literary Festival right now. So it's all a matter of hounding them or finding them somewhere, following them to the bathroom if you have to, or something. And you, you never know what might happen. So, yeah, there. That, that's really helpful. And I think um, there's one more bit of the process which I want to ask you about. And I have, I, I have two more questions and then I want to open up the audience because I'm assuming that some of you out there have written books or want to write books and I hope you'll have questions. And don't be shy about it, because um, as Prajwal said, I mean, if you have something to say, if you have a book to write, you must get up and say it. And, and don't, don't just keep it to yourself. Share, share your experience with everybody else. So my, last, uh, my second last question is, tell us a little bit about the editorial process. And this one I'm very interested in myself. So editors, is it a useful process? Is it a frustrating process? What did you make of that? No, absolutely. I mean, for me, my agent actually is my first editor because I send her the first draft or the second draft. Uh, whenever I feel I'm sort of done with it for now, I send it to my agent. And she reads it and she gives me a first uh, sort of look at it and, and notes. And then uh, most of the time, I, I love the notes that she gives me. And so I do another draft. Once we feel it's ready, then it goes to my editor at uh, Doubleday or, you know. So then there's another set of notes that come. And it's a very collaborative process for me. I like being able to talk about the work. I, I like to understand where it's gone wrong, where it's, you know, as David Mamet said, find that place in the manuscript where you took the wrong turn. Because there's always one spot where you may be veered off the path. You have to find that, that spot. And so I like the collaborative process. And then eventually, um, you come to a point where you're almost done with it. You're never completely done, but you're done, done with the book. I think it's so important to have a good editor. And uh, uh, if you have an editor with whom your work resonates, your life becomes so much easier. It, it really does. I mean, I have all these big fights with my editor over, over uh, the use of an adjective or an adverb. We exchange about 20 emails a day, and sometimes I win, sometimes he, he wins. Um, 
uh, I have used a number of Nepali words in my book. Uh, there are a, a lot of Nepali words in my book. And uh, I, I had an editor who, who was not my actual editor, but who read through my work, who had a slight problem with just how many Nepali words they use. Uh, but then I was adamant about those words being used, and then uh, my real editor stood behind me and said, if that's what you want, then we should do it. But uh, uh, as, as you said, my agent is also my first reader, and she is uh, incredibly generous with her time, and uh, I guess it helps that she runs a boutique agency. She is not a big agent. She doesn't have 50 different writers to look after. Um, and uh, it helps that she replies to my emails within three hours of my sending them. So uh, you're right, it's such a collaborative effort, is it not? And uh, yeah, have a good editor. I, I come across so many people complaining about their editors all the time, and I always wonder if that makes the writing and editing process an ordeal. I'm sure it does, because you have to get along well with your editor. Your editor has to believe in you, and there will be fights, trust me. Well, yeah. on that, I, I agree think, there. Yep. Yeah, I was just, just taking up that point about the relationship with the editor. I do, I think the relationship between author and editor is actually a very, very special relationship. And almost, you know, an emotional relationship. I mean, for me, it was very important, especially um, the very first commissioning editor who commissions your first book. Because on the author side, you know, this person, my first editor was a woman called Laura Palmer. And she, you know, she was helping me realize, you know, this dream that, that, to get published and on her side she will only commission a book if she has fallen in love with the book and you know I've you know so when the editor falls in love with the book or by extension they're almost in a slight way of, you know falling in love with the, the the mind of the person who created that book so you actually form this incredibly intense bond and then it can get you know like you know you say you are have these heated arguments with your editor or you know it can be quite a passionate affair I find no, it's a, it's, it's a very fascinating experience. Um, I actually had lots Is of Kartika bloody... Is Kartika here in the audience? Yes, Kartika here. <laughs> Kartika and I had lots of Bloody Marys at India Habitat Center. And she's an incredibly polite person. So she would very politely point out many mistakes. I'm just leaving. You know, this thing that you said about, uh, about, about a wrong turn. I think my whole book was full of wrong turns <laughs> and potholes, which was slowly weeded out. Uh, and, and there was also Shantanu, Ray Chaudhary, and Harper Collins, who's also an incredibly polite person, but who did one magical thing. And he sent it to somebody really young, right? I mean, and I didn't know how young. I, you know, they said, oh, well, you know, we're getting somebody else, you know. So he somehow felt that he was very old, and he said, well, you know, because you're young and the book needs to be seen by somebody young. And Kartika still insists on calling me a boy for some reason. So, you know, a whole bunch of people think I'm very young, though I'm not. But so he sent it to somebody, and, and that, 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 that lady obviously was, was obviously young and was vitriolic about the book. So it all came back in red with her saying, this is utter rubbish. What is he talking about? And to me, my first reaction, I have to be honest, I was like, who is this? So, but it really helped. And I, I went back and read the manuscript and I realized that many of the things that she was talking about, she was actually right. You know, th things that I had in my head wasn't translating onto paper. And then finally, when I got my agent who read it for the first time and said, you know, this, I would want you to completely rewrite the whole thing. So, you know, I really think if you approach this idea uh, with ego, then it's a real problem. I think it's a huge relief and a huge help if the process is collaborative. So before I open it up for questions, I'm going to ask each of you to give one piece of advice, just one piece of advice for the aspiring writers out here. I would agree with that notion, say, just write. Just, write. just do it. Start writing. Everyone has a story to tell. You are not a writer unless and until you have a book. Yeah. So. Start writing. <laughs> now. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just share with you what um, Norman Mailer once wrote in an essay. He said that if you've told yourself that you're going to write tomorrow morning, make sure you show up. Yeah. Because when you promise yourself that you're going to write, you're in a way entering into a contract with the subconscious. And what happens is, he said, if I'm too hungover or I had a late night, my subconscious shows up with all these treasures and I'm not there. 
and you have to really understand that because once you start writing you will actually feel you I feel I've let myself down because I've not had that discipline it's not that I'm not inspired I'm inspired but I'm lazy so there's a difference so that would be the one thing I would say so since all three of them have said just write essentially I mean I'm gonna say don't write because uh, George Bernard Shaw said uh, you know I write for the same reason that the cow gives milk so unless you feel that way you know you have to feel that I mean I think you know a lot of people think that like you were saying you know there's an idea there's a huge difference between an idea and a book so unless you really feel that you you know you're gonna write for the same reason that a cow gives milk you have to wait until that point comes why that's does a cow give milk I mean, so. <laughs> that's another story you know it's, we're all about holistic entertainment in this audience so we'll we'll let that pass but yeah so write only when you feel very strong so before we before we take questions i want to ask the audience just to get a sense because i can see there are lots of questions how many of you have thought about writing a book to raise your hand don't be shy wow. <laughs> That's about. There's quite a lot. Yeah. Almost 50 percent. Now, how many of you have written even one chapter of that book? I think I think I see more hands up for the second question <laughs> than the first. All right, uh, let's start with the first. Let's start with questions. Uh, the, the lady over here. Good morning. Um, well, it's, tell us your name and tell us yeah. a little bit about yourself. Good morning. I'm Malaika. Um, I love writing. I love poetry, but I'm doing design right now. And I have two questions very fast. Only um, one allowed purpose. <laughs> yeah. You're right. I'm the editor. You have to turn them into one question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, do you believe that words born out of... I, I have actually experienced this myself where I've gotten up and actually missed my bus or missed doing something because I just have to write there are these words in my head they need to be down on paper or I'll forget them I'll actually come out of the bathroom telling my friend listen write this down and I've dictated things so uh, do you think these words born out of pure creativity or compulsion for me uh, need to be edited uh, or is this overthinking also where do you stop with editing and can you stop with editing is this, this question for me or is it's that? open to the panel yeah. does, does mm, anyone want to say yeah. <laughs> Okay, my, my advice to you is that um, is, is, is first just think about what it is that you want to write, you know. Um, I don't think, as you said, I don't think this is something as like overthinking. I mean, if you're writing it, that means, you know, you, you've already taken it beyond the overthinking process. But um, I think before you send it to an editor or something, I mean, if you have a friend who you trust, whose opinion you trust, um, show it to them and as everyone here said be open to feedback but um, I always recommend sending something to an editor in quite a f in, in as close to a finished form as you can possibly get it to and um, also another piece of advice is don't take too much feedback just try and get it to the point that you're comfortable with first and then sort of share it with the world and allow it to you know have that space to become what it needs to be um, what's the next question um, gentlemen here. Yeah. Good morning. I'm Benodan and I sell technology and I write poetry. Well, that's a combination. Uh, actually, this question is to Prajwal. Prajwal, uh, you enrolled in an Oxford creative writing process and uh, a course. Uh, earlier, during uh, the Jaipur Literary Fest, there were some sessions where I quote Manu Joseph, who says, uh, the creative writing courses are a benign fraud. So I just wanted to understand how far is a creative writing course important for a writer or is it actually required? Uh, no, it's not required. You don't uh, go to a creative writing course to learn how to write. You should have already been a writer. You should have already been writing for quite some time before you start a creative writing masters. What a creative writing course facilitates is that it gets a group of like-minded people who are constantly writing, constantly creating, um, constantly thinking creatively together. Creative writing courses also help you get in touch with agents and publishers because a lot of these courses have direct contact with these people. Uh, my course at Oxford helped me dabble with genres that I would not have otherwise touched. 
Uh, this course forces you to explore poetry. I had I wrote my first poem at Oxford. It forces you to explore screen uh, screenwriting. I adapted one of my stories into a screenplay. If you have the money and the time, do it. If you don't have the money, I, I, I see no point wasting fifty thousand dollars on a creative writing masters. Uh, uh, yeah, that's that's my honest point of view. Yeah. Um, let's go to the back. The gentleman over there. Yeah, you. Don't worry, we have enough time for questions. So. Just two minutes before that girl over there asks uh, where can we stop with editing. I just want to know how, where do I start with editing? Because as that guy said, create Have you finished your book? Yes, ma'am. I am uh, hanging along with my manuscript for the past three days and I can't find any editor. I just realized now that there are many editors and agents are here. I don't want to, just, I can't see any. <laughs> how, do I, how do I know where are they? I don't have any Kartika, where are you? <laughs> Um, uh, what, I suggest, what I suggest you do is um, go on the internet, you submit your manuscript to people and for everybody out here, my advice when you're submitting a manuscript is write a short synopsis, write a little bit about yourself, not, I mean just a paragraph, not, not, don't try to write everything, be clear, have a manuscript which has everything in one document with numbered pages because very often I get manuscripts which have you know, 50,000 bits of paper and like everyone's in a most thoughts, but try and keep it to the point, describing what your book is actually about. I have the query letter prepared and synopsis prepared. All I right. have done everything. So this is, this is not really a question. I just <laughs> need an editor and or an Something agent. Else. Okay, we, we'll talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the lady in the blue. Uh, hello. Actually, it's a question of finding a personal equation between the editor and the author that has troubled me all along. In fact, I wrote uh, two novels, one published in Calcutta and the other one published in London. But then it was a question of, you know, it was not a question of luck. It was a question of giving money to them to publish it, you know. And then they, I don't know whether they even read it. I, th I think let's, let's try and keep it to questions rather so, than comments. So yeah. the question is that how do you find this personal equation? Well, I've never personally taken money to edit a book. But I yeah. Say. yeah, you should stay away from that. Yeah. That's, you should, you should never need to Just give anybody. Just stay away from any publishing house that says... Yeah. Normally uh, people ask me for money. To, yes. I see. But uh, in that situation, what is to be done, you know? I, I think... think I think your work itself will find the right editor. Yeah. I mean, uh, the editors also are, are people who can recognize talent. For example, Karthika Rapper Collins is my editor as well. And talking about the personal equation, I think sometimes you end up revealing so much of yourself to your editor in a way, mm -hmm. more than you would reveal to other people. And sometimes I tell them stories or I get to know them personally. But that is just as important apart for me because it informs them about my writing as well and helps us to discover where it is that I may want. So it is a very personal connection. The connection begins not personal, it begins with the work. The editor has to fall in love with your work and you get a lot of strength from that. So I get a lot of strength from my editor saying I love this book, I want to publish it. And that is where it all begins. I see. Um, there's a lady here with a question. Yeah. Okay. Hi, um, this is to all of you. I just want to know at what point did you decide that it was okay to quit your day job, uh, the thing that pays the bills? See, I was working in an advertising agency um, in Bombay. Uh, I worked as a copywriter for a year and I just decided to leave everything. And I, of course, I had not written a single word until then. I took the flight to Canada and from sort of Hong Kong to Vancouver, I had a mini panic attack because I realized I had not written a single word. So I started writing on the plane to see if I could write. I wrote one paragraph, I said this is brilliant and I went to sleep. Um, I would not suggest anyone ever do that. Um, it's an unusual way of doing things, but then again I was 24, I was single. Um, I had spent most of my life on motorcycles, playing soccer, gambling, doing other things that cannot be said at the Tata Steel front lawns. Um, but most importantly, you have to have a story to tell. 
that's the most important thing. You don't have to quit your day job. In fact, you shouldn't. Uh, make writing your night job. But provided you have a story to tell and you're totally consumed by it, you're, you'll be fine. Anyone else or should we move on to the next question? No. Well, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm probably the only one here who has a day job. And in fact, I really believe that my day job as a journalist adds to what I write. If it weren't for my day job, many of the experiences that I have as a writer and a lot of the content that I get comes from my day job. So it depends on what kind of day job you have. It's not necessarily that all day jobs are bad. And, you know, Arush, of course, makes a lot of money, clearly, from his books. Not at all. I am still struggling, so I, don't. <laughs> I, I continue to, uh, you know, have a day job and will for some time. The lady over there. Yeah. Hi. Um, my question is to any of you. I think I have a really nice story to tell, but what I'm hesitant about, I've just started writing my novel, what I'm hesitant about is the craft of writing, expressing that story in the best possible way that I can. And since this is my first story, how do you get over, or how do you develop that craft? I mean, I guess it comes only after you write so much, so how do you get over that? Um, can you be a little more specific? What do you mean, or how do you want to develop what? Expressing the story. The story is there and it's being expressed as best I can right now on the page. But I'm always concerned that I can improve my expression of it because this is the first time I'm writing fiction. Uh, so is that even something to consider or not? Yeah, that is a problem that you and every Nobel Prize winner in the world has. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I doubt if we are ever completely enamored by our, our writing. Uh, there is always something to something that we have problems with at the end. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I, I, I cringe when I read my own writing in, uh, in this book that just came out. So I think it, if, you're, if you think it's okay, maybe send it out to a few readers, your friends. Yeah, um, see what they have to say. Yes, Submit it to a magazine. Show it the light of day is what I suggest. Yeah, I was going to say that. I think maybe actually what I often find helpful is actually taking some time away from it. Even you know, maybe a couple of weeks or something and then suddenly coming back to it. And uh, unfortunately, it's never as good as you remember it being, you know, the second time around. But um, you look at it with fresh eyes and then, you know, don't review that too many times. Maybe after one edit, you can, um, you know, send, before you start overthinking, you can maybe send it out. No, also, I think, I mean, I, I'm fascinated in India especially, how many people keep saying that they don't think reading is necessary for writing? I mean, I'm shocked how many people say that. Look, if you're going to want to write, you have to read what other people have read. I mean, there's a whole universe. I mean, you can never finish it, but at least start reading. I mean, but I, I keep hearing all these people who want to write books and say, oh, I don't really care about reading. I've read three books in my life. That's madness. So since we are running out of time, we have time for three more questions. And before I start them, I would just like to request you to make your questions very crisp so as to give everybody enough time. Um, there's a lady in the front here who's been, yeah. Over here. And I'm going to, yeah. Hi, this is for Eka. Um, I was just wondering, um, because of your past being a model and still very beautiful, and you. do you find that that's been, because I know for Tara Moss in Australia, first of all, people were really concentrating on her looks, and that was really annoying to her because she was actually a very clever and very uh, racy writer. And she, do you find that's been a hindrance or a help to your career? Yeah, I mean that that's a really interesting question, actually. Um, I, 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 you know, just be, being a young woman, um, I guess it could, could, could not, can have its, its advantages and its drawbacks. Um, luckily, I write books that it, you know, um, well, a luckily, I've got, because I was educated at Oxford, I think people um, automatically think that that gives me a, me a certain basic level of intelligence. But actually, to be honest, I write, you know, I write um, f quite fun books about serious themes, but um, they're set in sort of glitzy, racy, sort of, you know, environments, glamorous locations. So actually, sort of a background of, uh, of modeling, um, that helps. I mean, you can see the, co the covers of some of the books, sort of ra rather glamorous looking young women on, on yours. So, so actually, it, um, it's, uh, 
No, it's been it's been an amusing um, an amusing sort of uh, uh, background, I think. And uh, I, I think nowadays people don't find it too difficult to understand that that we're all multifaceted people, that we've all got different elements um, elements to us, and that you know. Uh, you can be interested in a number of different things. Whilst I was modelling, I was also playing chess competitively. It's just, you know, I, 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 I think I'm lucky to live now in, a, in an environment where women can, can pretty much do what they want to do. Um, and, you know, there are, obviously, you will sometimes come up against, um, against people with their own uh, prejudices or opinions. But um, really, I would advise anyone, no matter what their circumstances are, no matter what, matter what their background is, not to be intimidated, um, and publishing, you know, there, it's notoriously there's, um, you know, there is a bit of intellectual snobbery within the publishing world. There's a distinction that's um, often talked about between sort of more highbrow literary novels and popular fiction. But um, really, I think any book that brings joy to a reader um, should should be valued. And I couldn't yeah. agree with you more. There. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the lady over there. Thank you so much for this chance to speak. I've actually struggled with a book called Bollywood on the Bend, and I live in Bombay. I'm editing Hello magazine. And for me, it's been a mixed bag about working full time and trying to write a creative uh, book with a different language and a different cadence and a different creative uh, sort of journey. <clears throat> in order to get my voice as a creative writer, I found with the nine to five with Brian, I had to get out of the city, I had to get out of the job for three weeks, go to Scotland, do a course in creative writing, listen to my own voice as and not a journalist. And that was a very tough journey because you get, like you said, you get egoistic and you get kind of like, this is who I am. So yeah, you need to kill yourself a little bit, get away from everything, start from scratch, tell yourself you've forgotten how to write and then get back and unfortunately uh, I still don't have the marriage that editor marriage that I'm looking I'm, for I'm yeah. we just uh, can you just ask the question yeah. because so yeah. the question is sometimes a publisher makes you redraft your work and they don't read the second and the third draft have any of you dealt with that problem and got lost and stopped writing um, I would I never stop writing because someone stopped reading my work by the time the publisher gets involved with your manuscript, you, you know, they normally sort of get, have invested a bit of time in you, so they're sort of committed to helping normally you get that manuscript to a stage that it's able, they're able to publish it. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman over there. You. Um, I, I'm a travel journalist and writer, and before I even write anything, I make sure I know who my audience is. Uh, that's probably the number one key word. So I have a question for you, Mira. Uh, three of the writers there said just write. You're the one who has to sit and read all these manuscripts and you might come across some beautifully written ones but go, I don't think there's an audience for this or it's, it's too marginal. What's your, your advice then on just write without knowing who you're writing for? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I'm often in a situation where um, you know, people tell you that there's something which is obviously commercial or there's something which is obviously, you know. I, th I think that the way I tend to work around it is I follow that rule sometimes and, but the thing is you have to take creative risks, otherwise you end up sort of repeating yourself all the time. And as an editor, I think it's important not to try, just the same way it is for a writer. I don't want to be publishing the same book again and again, you know, so I think that um, I, I actually quite like taking risks in terms of, you know, but we don't actually know until a book comes out who that reader is. I mean, we, we can make a good guess, but at, at the same time, I think we, as editors, it's, it's part of our job to try and, you know, try new things. And I hope writers will remember that because sometimes writers feel that they feel pressured to write a certain kind of thing because they've heard that it's commercial. And my advice to you would be just write the story that you know, write the story that you're comfortable with, write, write about what you know, you know, and you can't really compromise on that. Uh, we have time for one last question. Um, I think we have the gentleman over there. And then we have to, I'm sorry, we have to wrap it up. Uh, hi. I just wanted to know how you guys deal with writer's block when you just can't write. That's a very good question. Yeah. 
Well, I, I said earlier, for me, there's no such thing as writer's block. It's just the writer's impatience. We'll have and to move away from... He, uh, he's I the most disciplined with you. I don't block. Block. <laughs> 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 perpetually have writer's block. But it, it, something keeps on happening, as you said, underneath the surface. Something is happening all the time. And it's, it takes time for it to come from below to, to above. And you just have to wait. We're going to have to ask the less disciplined lot of here. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think you just carry on with yeah. your life if you have yeah. writer's block. Go watch mindless TV, read. Uh, don't let it affect you so much. And then the writing will eventually come back. Or another tip is, I mean, I'm often inspired by people. So you find someone who's really fascinating, he's really interesting. You know, go to a party where you're going to meet some people who have a lot to say or an event or, you know, and, and you'll often find that a conversation with a really witty or a really funny person or somebody who's got a really sad or emotional story will trigger all sorts of thoughts in your head and you'll suddenly rush back to your computer and begin writing. No, and also, I mean, this entire thing about writer's block, you know, writing comes from living life. So, you know, you have to live your life and live it to the fullest and let the writing emerge and be organic, you know, come organically from that. So you can't shut yourself in a room and say, I've got writer's block. I'm not going to leave this room until this block goes away. That's not how it works. You live life and let the writing come. I think on that very sound piece of advice, I'd like to thank Aita, Hindol, Bajwal, and Anosh. And I'd really like to thank all of you and sort of wish you luck. And, you know, when you have those moments when you wonder whether it's worth it, I mean, I think this is the best advice that you can get. Um, thank you very much. And I think there's going to be a book signing, but I'm going to let you tell yeah. them about that. Thank you all for a very, very insightful uh, session. Thank very you. helpful for aspiring writers. There will be book signing at the far end of the lawns where the umbrellas are. Thank you so much. Our next session will be at 11.15.